Hello, and welcome to Remapping Explosions. Today I'm going to be walking through a scenario of remedying tech debt. And in order to do so, I'll be telling you the story of the Zebra's logging system replacement. My name is Lee Bonacue. I've been a software engineer on the Zebra's infrastructure team for about a year and a half now. This team focuses primarily on improving processes and tooling that were originally brought to introduce to the company when there were about a dozen engineers and today we need those systems to appropriately support over 100 engineers. I personally spend a lot of my time working with Kubernetes, CICD, observability, and automation and in order to do so I bring a strong background in site reliability engineering, back-end development, and scripting and this allows me to have a software-driven mindset within our DevOps team. For those who aren't familiar with the Zebra, it is an insurance search and comparison website, often compared to Kayak, but for insurance. And the team here has been growing really fast. Uh, we have about 250 employees, 75 of those being engineers, and about half of those employees have started in my time with the company. And finally, for a bit of context about our systems, we run dozens of microservices and are running Kubernetes in production. Now we'll look at a table of contents for our story today. We're going to start out by looking at what a mapping explosion is. Then we'll look at how a mapping explosion managed to man itself, manifest itself within the Zebra's logging system. From here, we'll look at a lot of the data that existed in our old logging system. There was a lot of really useful stuff there, and in order to start figuring out our problems, we had to dig through it. We were also able to use a lot of this data that we collected to start populating our Datadog implementation so that we could set a solid foundation and hit the ground running. So we'll look at our pipelines and our standard attributes that we use. Standard attributes gave us a really good uh, first step in preventing mapping explosions in the future by tracking our fields and stuff like that. And finally, there's always next steps, uh, especially in a situation like this. We'll look at how we wanted to continue to build on this new foundation that we had created for ourselves. So what is a mapping explosion? A mapping explosion is a situation where you're generating an unsustainable number of indexed or faceted fields. Uh, this is usually due to poor usage of key value pairs. There are two main ways that uh, mapping explosions manifest themselves. Uh, one is through iterating keys and another is through duplicate keys. And you'll see an example of each of those here on the bottom left. I'm not going to try to verbally walk through each of them. So if you need to, feel free to pause and take a longer look. On the right side of your screen, you will see a blog post uh, that was published by Elastico itself uh, a few years back. And this blog post titled Six Ways to Crash Your Elasticsearch uh, had mapping explosions as number one on the list. And this really writes home how common these key anti-patterns are. Now to look more in depth at the Zebra. So our old logging system uh, was self-hosted on AWS. We deployed it out using Ansible and it was in Elk stack, uh, Elasticsearch, Logstash, Kibana with a gray log sibling deployment alongside it. Now, this is a perfectly valid system that's used at many places. Uh, however, it hadn't aged well, well, well at the Zebra. Uh, and this was due to employee turnover and changes in technical vision. The state of the system uh, wasn't very well maintained and the infrastructure's code that we did have for it uh, quickly lost trust. So as a result, uh, it was hard to properly scale as we needed to send more and more logs to the system. Additionally, 
administration of data indexes doesn't necessarily uh, have a natural overlap with your average DevOps skill set. And as a result of all this, uh, we had a lot of trouble meeting some of our most basic success metrics around ingestion and retention. You, when an event fires, you want to be able to see it in your logging system within five minutes. And if you're looking at your logs, you want to be able to look back 30 days. And we simply weren't able to do either of those things. Now, this issue, this issue extended beyond just our infrastructure. After all, the source of the majority of the source of mapping explosions is most frequently in your log content rather than the system that you're logging to. Our apps were decently verbose, uh, as any production system at scale could be expected to be. We are processing terabytes of data every month and indexing billions of events. Um, some immediately apparent lowlights of our system were the fact that we had over 5,000 index fields in our elk stack. And when you really dug deep into them, 3,200 of them immediately met my qualification of what a mapping explosion is. As we move further down, you'll see some examples from our own data set of where we saw these issues. A car ID field could show up in 137 different places, this mostly being the result of splintering parent fields. Uh, objects can have multiple levels to them, and if you log in that same format, your uh, child keys end up nested underneath the parent. On the iteration type examples, uh, one that was immediately obvious to me was uh, some locations where we were using state abbreviations in our key naming. We had six different places where we were doing that. Six keys, 50 states, that's immediately 300 index fields that could be six. And we also had a spot where car number was showing up multiple times in keys. Car one, car two, car three. We had 700 keys that were the result of something like that. So all those stats that we just took a look at uh, were the result of some quick Python scripting against our Elasticsearch API endpoints. At the top here, you'll see uh, some pseudocode and some of the endpoints that helped us out the most in this process, those being the mapping fields URL and the search URL. Making sense of our thousands of fields would have been nearly impossible uh, without doing work in this way. Uh, just too much to make sense of. On the bottom, you will see some of our post-processed data that we output from these scripts. Here we've collected lists of uh, those splintering parent keys as well as duplicate child keys. After a research period, we decided to use Datadog for our new logging system. We had used them in the past for infrastructure monitoring and APM, and their new logging solution uh, really fit the bill for us. Uh, we're going to be highlighting some of the use cases around pipelines and standard attributes, but before we do so, I wanted to set up a before and after uh, so that we can better make sense of the reasoning as we go along. Here you can see four log statements. Developer number one and developer number two worked on that on the same code base over the course of several months. Developer one logged a piece of data that he thought was best represented by the key foo, and that's foo with four O's. Dev two logged the same piece of data but thought it was best represented with foo with two O's. On top of this, the logging library that they were using uh, additionally nested the field under a generated parent key. This parent key is unnecessary, but re reflects a quirk that we had in our own log processing. Now one piece of data has become four. So we've identified some of the splintering parents and the conflicting child keys. Now what do we do with them? For parent keys, we've been leveraging the pipelines tool. Some of our apps have upwards of 200 splintered parent fields. Um, 
and we've used the data that we audited from our ELK stack to immediately fill in these configurations. Uh, we consolidated these parent keys to one static location named extra using the remapper tool within those pipelines. For child keys, we like to use the standard attribute tool. The remapping here behaves similarly to the one in the pipelines. Uh, however, we use this for doing some corrections to small variations. In this view, we're also able to come up with a consensus of what the best name is for a piece of data and give a description to it. Just having a list of all the fields that we log in one place does wonders for uh, our process of eliminating, eliminating the knowledge silos uh, where these fields are only known by the developers that introduce them. So uh, now that we have these two tools in place, uh, we have one consistent location where we can index and begin using field-based search. Why is this important? We talked about resource scaling issues that happen uh, as the result of recklessly stretching your index. Uh, we talked about that a lot earlier on in the talk, but there's also uh, some other side effects that can come about as the result of bad field management. It impacts how you query your content. Having too many fields encourages a dependence on full text search. Field-based search is nearly impossible since one couldn't possibly know all the different fields that exist. And even if they knew which fields existed, they wouldn't have any faith that that field uh, would contain all the relevant data. Using this setup, we were able to convince our developers and quality engineers that they could live without full text search. And that really sets us on the road to a more healthy ecosystem. So the tools that we're using in Datadog are really powerful. However, it's still just a band-aid over a larger issue. And how do we get to a place where these hacks are no longer needed. Uh, in order to do that, uh, we're gonna have to do a lot of cultural change and get the whole engineering org on the same page. Uh, that some of the things that we can do is start leveraging metrics more uh, significantly and where appropriate. Uh, we've leaned on logs for probably 80 to 90% of our observability in the past and metrics are just cheaper easier to keep for a longer period of time and have better time-based analysis that you can do on them. Introducing shared libraries. Uh, if you have a dozen repos and they're all running their own logger and some of them have copy and pasted from other, from, uh, other repos, that's all gonna drift over time. Uh, you'll end up with 12 different implementations and if you need to do a change across all of them, uh, it becomes difficult. So with a shared library, uh, you can introduce changes quickly and roll them out by pushing a new version of that library. And finally, uh, auditing your fields more proactively uh, really helps to get ahead of this. We didn't start evaluating our fields until we had nearly 5,000 of them. So code reviews that are uh, that spend time rigorously evaluating what field names are or making light of fields that already exist uh, can really help a lot. Docu putting documentation together for your ops team. Uh, your operations team, if they're going to debug your app, uh, would probably like to know what information you're uh, emitting and what that information means. Uh, data that is in your logging system uh, should not be treated as lesser, or it can be treated as lesser than like a, a production ETL pipeline, but there still needs to be some structure there. And finally, if you're getting really aggressive within that shared library, maybe you introduce a field whitelist. A field has to be vetted and introduced to the library before it's allowed to be logged. And that about summarizes uh, the uh, story of how we migrated from an Elk stack to a Datadog cluster to Datadog and a lot of our opinions on uh, logging that we learned along the way. 
If you are curious and want to know more, or you thought what you learned today was really interesting, uh, feel free to check out thezebra.com and zebra.com slash careers. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the company has been growing like crazy and is constantly hiring. Uh, thank you to Datadog for giving me this time, and everyone have a good time. <laughs>